Hello, in this video, we're going to cover 2.3, analyzing graphs of functions. So the first slide we have here says the graph of a function, um, one out of three. So we have studied functions from an algebraic point of view. And in this section, we will study functions from a graphical perspective. So the graph of a function f is essentially the collection of ordered pairs, x, comma, fancy notation for y, such that x is in the domain of f. As you study this section, remember that x equals the directed distance from the y-axis, meaning whether you positive, you go to the right, negative, you go to the left, and y, or this new notation for y, f of x, is the directed distance from the x-axis. So if the y value or the function value is positive, it will be up. And if the function value is negative, it'll be downward. So the use of dots, open or closed, at the extreme left and right points of a graph indicates that the graph does not extend beyond these points. Um, if such dots are not on the graph, then assume that the graph extends beyond the points. By the definition of a function, at most one value corresponds to a given x value. This means that the graph of a function cannot have two or more different points with the same x coordinate. And no two points on the graph of the function can be vertically above or below each other. It follows then that a vertical line can intersect the graph of a function at most once. It could not intersect it at all, and that's okay. But if it intersects it two times or more, then it is not a function. Um, this observation provides a convenient visual test called the vertical line test for functions. Now we have seen it before. This is just a more formal definition of it. So it says the vertical line test for functions. A set of points in a coordinate plane is the graph of y as a function of x. If and only if no vertical line intersects the graph at more than one point. So for this example, it says use the graph of the function to find A, the domain, B, the function values, F of negative one, F of two, and C, the range. Um, and then we should probably, before we even do that, is just verify that it actually is a function. It says graph, use the graph of the function. So they're telling you that it's a function, but if you were to apply the vertical line test and draw a bunch of vertical lines, none of these vertical lines intersect the graph more than one time each. Okay, so then therefore it is the image of a graph of a function, or it is the graph of a function and not just a relation. So in order for me to find the domain, it's the set of all x values. So we know that x values are here from left to right. So the graph does start here on the left with a solid, which means a bracket. And then it goes all the way until it gets here, but it has an open dot, which corresponds to the parentheses. So then the domain there would be from negative one with the bracket to five with a parentheses. Now the range is a little bit different. The range is a set of y values, so you want to go from low to high. So it obviously is the lowest point is here, and since it's a solid line, it will have a bracket here. And then up here is the highest point, and so since it's also solid, um, we would have a bracket here. Now this pole, it would be an issue, okay? If there was no definition for this y value here, and here, then we definitely would be having a gap in our range. But because I do have a y value there and there, um, I know when you, when you zoom in, they don't quite line up, okay? But you do have values there, so there truly is no gap in the y values. So then our range is gonna be from the lowest y value of negative three up until the highest y value, which seems to be positive three. And now for the function values. 
So this is saying when x equals negative one, what is the y? And when x is equal to two, what is that y value? Okay, so f of negative one. When x is negative one, the graph is up here and that y value is a positive one. Then f of two. When x is equal to two, the graph is down here and this y value is a negative three. So now we have, um, oh, I already went over this section. Now we have the zeros of a function. Now we've heard this words before, zeros. So we're just gonna keep talking more about that. So it says zeros of a function. Um, if the graph of a function x has an x-intercept at a certain point, then that x value of the x-intercept is called a zero of the function. The zeros of a function, um, f of x, are the x values for which the entire function equals zero, okay? Or another way of saying that is when y equals zero. And we know that if the y value is zero, that you live on the x-axis, which is the definition of an x-intercept, okay? Now, for example, two, it wants us to find the zeros of each of these three functions, okay? So the first one is, is you're gonna take that whole function and equal it to zero. If you can factor it, factor it, and then set each factor equal to zero and solve for your solutions. If you cannot factor this, use the quadratic formula and you'll still end up with the same two solutions. But once you find those solutions, these guys are your quote unquote zeros. So if you were to graph the polynomial, you would notice that it has the x-intercept of negative two and positive five over three, okay? Now for part B, if I take the function from part B and I set it equal to zero, we're gonna square both sides. And so the house goes away on this side and zero squared is still zero. Then we're going to, it looks like they added x squared to both sides. So then on this side, we just have 10. And on this side, we now have x squared. And then when we take the square root on both sides, we get that plus or minus. Um, so x equals plus or minus the square root of 10. And so if you were to graph this function, it looks like a curve. And look, there are your x-intercepts at negative square root of 10 and positive square root of 10. Now for part C, so we're gonna take this function and equal it to zero. And you can multiply both sides by your common denominator. And over here, this would cancel leaving you with just the two t, the two t minus three. And over here, zero times anything is still zero. So then you would add three to both sides, which gives you this equation. And then you would divide by two on both sides, which would result in this equation. And so the only quote unquote zero that you have here is this three halves, which means you have an X intercept or it's not an X intercept, it's a T, a T intercept at three, three halves comma zero. And if you were to graph that function, it looks like this and it does have the X intercept at three halves. Now, the more you know about the graph of a function, the more you know about the function itself. Consider the graph shown in this figure. And as you move from left to right, the graph falls between the x values, um, negative two and zero, okay? So the graph is falling from left to right. If I keep tracing this from left to right, now it's staying constant from the x value zero to the x value two. Then it starts to rise from left to right from x equal to two until x equal to four, okay? So this is the formal definition. It says a function f is what's called increasing on an open interval 
when, as you go to the right, the y values will get larger, okay? So here I am, x1 is smaller than x2, meaning here's x1, here's x2. And if the x1, y value, whatever it is, okay, this is y1. If the other x value, as I go to the right, this x value is even bigger, right? Bigger than this one. It means it'd be up there somewhere, okay? And if the second x value, it, the second y value is higher, then it is increasing, okay? As you go from left to right. And vice versa, still the x values are increasing. So here's x1 and here's x2. But the y values here, this y value, whatever it is, the second one is smaller. And so then in that case, from left to right, it's actually decreasing. And then finally, when you're constant, it means that even though you're moving to the right in your x values, the y value stays the same. Okay. And then that's constant. It kind of looks like a flat line. Okay. Those are the formal definitions of increasing, decreasing, and constant. So to help you decide whether the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant on an interval, you can evaluate the function for several values of x. However, you really need calculus to determine for certain all the intervals on which a function is increasing, decreasing, and, or constant, okay? For us, we would usually have graphs when they ask us if a function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. But eventually, when you do get to calculus, you don't need to have the graph in order to decide that. You can figure out where it's increasing and decreasing in constant um, just using algebra and calculus techniques, okay? Um, but for right now, if they ever ask me about in intervals of increasing, decreasing, or constant functions, they will provide an image in which I can give them those intervals kind of like the way we did the domain on that one graph. So the points at which a function changes its increasing, decreasing, or constant behavior are helpful in determining what are called relative minimums or relative maximum values of the function. Why is it called relative min and relative max versus just min and max, okay? Think of a polynomial. A polynomial, when you graph it, could look like this. This is just an example of a polynomial. Now notice that this is the absolute maximum. It's the highest value out of the whole graph. But this one is also called a local maximum or a relative maximum. So both point A and point B, A and B are local or relative maximums. However, B is the absolute maximum. Now this one down here, which I'll call C, C is also a local or relative minimum. Okay, the peaks will be your maximums, the valleys will be your minimums. However, if you notice, this thing goes down forever on both sides, which means there is no absolute minimum. It goes down forever. There's no spot where it stops and that's the actual lowest y value. Okay, so the formal definitions here says that a function value f of a is called a relative minimum of f where there exists an interval x1, x2 that contains a such that this y value is going to be smaller than every other y value in this interval, okay? And the same thing for the relative maximum, except that y value should be bigger because it's the max, right? It should be bigger than all the other y values in this interval. So 
So in this figure, it shows several different examples of relative minimum and relative maximum. So notice you've got two relative minimums. This one here also happens to be an absolute maximum. Oh no, it won't have an absolute ma maximum. Why will this function not have an absolute maximum? Because as long as this doesn't end with a dot, you're supposed to assume that it carries on forever. And the same thing here, it doesn't end with a dot. So you're supposed to assume that it keeps going in this direction. So if this is going up, 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 won't it surpass this? So, and we don't know how far up it's going, it's going up forever. So there is no relative, there's no absolute maximum. Similarly, this side's going down, 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 it'll surpass these um, Y values going even lower. So then it doesn't have an absolute minimum either. All the valleys are gonna be relative mins and all the peaks are gonna be relative maxes. And it says, we will study a technique for finding the exact point at which a second degree polynomial function has a relative minimum or relative maximum. For the time being, however, you can use a graphing utility to find reasonable approximations of these points. We won't be given any problems where that will be necessary, but they're just letting you know that right now we don't have any other tool than visually seeing it. Okay, so here's example three. It does ask me to use the graphs to describe the increasing, decreasing, or constant behavior of each function, okay? And so I can see if I trace it from going left to right that this is increasing. And even when it gets to this pivotal spot, it's still increasing the whole time it's increasing. And remember, this actually has arrows in both directions. So how far left is this going? Well, this arrow is going downward and leftward at the same time forever. And this arrow is going upward, but also to the right forever. So I don't know how far left it goes. Since it's going left forever, it's going toward negative infinity. And since it's going to the right forever, it's going toward positive infinity. So then this thing is going to be increasing on the entire interval from negative infinity to infinity. Here it says the function is increasing over the entire real line but this interval is gonna be more of what they're gonna want from you in the homework, okay? Now, let's go ahead and look at the second one. The second one, um, as I trace it from left to right, this thing is going up, 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 but then when it gets to this spot, it starts to go down, okay? So then if I trace that, it's going downward, but then when it gets to this spot down here, it's going back up, okay? So the intervals for increasing are gonna be different here. This is going this way. So it's going down forever and left forever, which I know goes eventually to negative infinity. This end is going up forever, but it's also going to the right forever, which goes to positive infinity, okay? And so when I'm doing my increasing, it's gonna be here, which is going to negative infinity up until it gets to here and that X value is negative one. Negative one. Then I'm gonna put a union because there's another section that's also increasing. And it's increasing at this X value one and then forever, it's forever going to the right toward positive infinity. Now for decreasing, that's the section in the middle. And the section in the middle goes from this x value of negative one to this x value of one. And so that's the interval where it is decreasing. And if you notice, this says the same thing. It says it's increasing on this interval, then decreasing on the next interval, and then increasing on the last interval again, okay? But I typed it in the way you would be expected to type it in on the computer. So if you do have two intervals of where it's increasing, you have to put them together with a union symbol. Now, finally, we're gonna to get to this one. So this one is going up as I trace. So this one's increasing here. Then when it gets there, it's actually constant. 
And then finally, when it gets to the right hand side, um, I'm trying to find a different color. But when it gets to this side, it's actually decreasing. Okay. So, how do we put that in intervals for increasing? It's going to be from here to here. Remember, that's an arrow. So it's actually going to the left to negative infinity. And then it stops here at this x value, which is 0. So from negative infinity to 0. Then for the constant, it's going to be from this x value, which is 0, to this x value, which is 2. And then finally, for the decreasing, It's going to be from this x value of 2. And then since this is going in this direction, it's eventually going to go to positive infinity to the right. And so those are my three intervals for part C. OK. Now, keep in mind that even though these had solid dots, notice that I did not put solid or brackets on my intervals, okay? And that is because of a theory regarding calculus, okay? You can never include the endpoints when deciding where it's increasing, decreasing, or constant, because by definition, um, calculus definition, you cannot technically increase at one specific spot. So if you're located here, okay, this is the only output value you have is this one spot, okay? You're not gonna increase or decrease at just that one spot. You have to have two different values in order for you to compare on whether or not they are increasing or decreasing or constant, okay? So you cannot do anything with just one point. It does not, you cannot say it is increasing or decreasing at a specific point. It's only in a specific region, okay? So you don't ever include these x values because it does not increase or decrease at zero or at two. It's only increasing or decreasing in between the zero and the two or the two and the infinity or the negative infinity and the zero, okay? So now we can move on to something called average rate of change. Now, average rate of change is just a fancy way of saying the slope between two lines, OK? So this is just equal to the slope between two points. And so here's one point given to you. Here's another point given to you. And if you were to draw a line through there, you're essentially finding the slope of this line. This guy right here is the average rate of change. So of course, its formula is going to look a lot like the formula for slope. Now, if you remember the formula from slope from the previous class, the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And if you look at the formula for the average rate of change, it's literally the same thing, except instead of saying y2, they use the fancy notation for y2 and call it f of x2. And again, instead of using y1, they use the fancy notation for it, and that's f of x1. But you're essentially subtracting the y values on top and subtracting the x values on the bottom. And then that gives you your average rate of change. In calculus, this is called the slope of the secant line. And in calculus, you'll learn more about the slope of the tangent line eventually, okay? So here's example four. It says, find the average rates of change of this function and for part A between these two numbers and for part B between those two numbers, okay? So essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna apply the average rate of change formula for the first set of numbers. And so it looks like they already labeled one of them x1 and one of them x2. So you're just plugging the x2 into this parentheses, the x1 into this parentheses. And then where are they coming up with these values, right? That's the big question, is where did these numbers come from? 
Okay, I can see that negative one minus a negative two, the plus sign, so negative one plus two is positive one. We get that one. But if I wanna do F of negative one, I have to plug it into that formula. And I get negative one plus three, which is equal to two. And then F of negative two would be negative two cubed minus three times negative two. So I get negative eight plus six, which is negative two. And so that's where that value came from. And then let's see, what do we get here? This becomes a big giant plus sign. So two plus two is four over one, which is just four. And so that's the average rate of change between those two numbers. But it also asked us for the average rate of change between another two numbers. So again, we're plugging in zero. So F of zero and F of one. F of one is gonna be one cubed minus three times one. So one minus three, which equals negative two. So for F of one, they have negative two. Now, when I plug in zero, I get zero minus zero, which is zero. And so then for F of zero, they have just zero. So then negative two minus zero is negative two. One take away zero is one and negative two over one is just negative two. Now let's go ahead and go to our practice problems. So it says determine the open intervals, which means parentheses, don't put brackets. Determine the open intervals on which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Okay, and enter your answers using interval notation. If an answer does not exist, do write DNE. So they're basically going to say increasing. And it's going to have a blank and you need to type in the intervals. Then it's going to say decreasing. And again, have a blank and you have to fill that in. And then it's going to say constant. And a blank and you have to fill that in. Okay. So I'm going to trace it starting from the left side. And as I trace it, it's going down, 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 down until it gets here. So this is all decreasing. Then from there, it goes up, 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 up. So all of this area, it's increasing, okay? So when I'm doing my intervals of increasing, it's gonna be from this X value, from this X value six to, and since it's going up forever and to the right forever, it would be to infinity. Now for the decreasing, Again, this is going up forever, but also to the left forever. So that would be starting at negative infinity. And then it goes from negative infinity all the way to here and the X value there is six. Now this thing is not flatlined anywhere. So it's not constant anywhere. So in that case, you would type in D and E for the constant. It just simply is not constant anywhere. Now, the next problem says find the average rate of change from x1 to x2. So we're gonna use that formula, um, f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. So we get f of four minus f of one over four minus one. The bottom we get three. For the top, I'm not sure. I need to do this on the side. So I'm gonna do this on the side, f of four is negative two times four cubed plus five times four squared plus four, which actually equals, let's see, negative two parentheses four cubed plus five times four squared plus four. And I get negative 44. Here's the minus sign. And then now I'm going to figure out f of 1. So negative 2 times 1 cubed plus 5 times 1 plus 1. And we get 7. And so that's the value there. So 44, negative 44 and minus seven is negative 51. 
and then divide that by three, we get 17, oh, negative 17. And so this is the average rate of change for that problem. But that is essentially the end of this section. So you'll be having to do intervals of increasing, decreasing, you may and constant. You may have to do domains and range from a graph like we did in other example. And you'll also have to find average rates of change.